I did do the largest study in history on dating. What they found was absolutely startling. If you are going to go on dates or whatever it is, my biggest recommendation is... This is John Levy, a behavioral scientist who has spent the last 10 years hosting astronauts, billionaires, and athletes at his home for some of the most exclusive dinner parties in the world. He has dedicated his life to researching human behavior and has uncovered the secrets to dating outside your league, making lifelong friends, and becoming the most interesting person in the room. Shout out to Aspire for subscribing if you want to get a shout out in next week's episode, hit the subscribe button. Now, enjoy my combo with John Levy. Welcome to camp. John Levy. Yes. How are you, sir? I'm fantastic. It's great I'm to so see you. so excited to be here. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Um, I'm going to be drinking my coffee, if that's okay with you. It's, uh, I know it's, a, I, it's... I don't drink coffee. I know it's I'm, against your uh, your personal ethos. I, I wouldn't go that far. I just never got hooked into Why? it. Why? I, Why'd you never drink coffee? Uh, because I don't have a tough time waking up. I can just like wake up and go. And if, mm. and if you don't need the caffeine, then you don't need to, you don't end up with that lull later in the day. Right. But it does kind of make you feel good though. Yeah. I mean, listen, if, it, if I'm going to consume something to make me feel good, it's like, there's plenty of other things I could take. Uh, okay. That's, you know, fair. Like that's I'd, fair. I'd rather, you know, on a weekend go out for drinks with friends. It's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Irish coffee. See, just do yes. one of those and you'll mix both. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely do like <laughs> in college, my college days, I definitely had some Kahlua yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. drinks and Basically like white Russians and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm so excited to talk. I read your book. You're invited. Awesome. I, I knew somebody would. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was the one. If yeah. you looked on your, on your data and you're like, okay, one read, it was me. Yes. Okay. All uh, those hours, it was worth it <laughs> just for the impact exactly, it's going exactly. to have on you. And I thought it was great. I really thought it was, uh, I thought it was really fun. So I guess the first thing, the broad question, okay, that I think a lot of people want to know that I want to know also that we can break down through the book. How can I be more influential? Ooh, that's it. So we can break that down. You can start wherever you want. Okay. Yeah. But how can I be more influential? So let's break down a few things. First of all, Let's separate being a influencer, because the word has been kind of used. I don't like to, that word. Yeah, from being influential. Okay. Right. So an influencer is kind of this word that marketers use to describe somebody who has a large media following of some kind, either right. on like some social media platform, a blog, or whatever. But you're really kind of either a journalist or a content producer. Right. Right. And that's amazing, and it's a very unique skill set, and people who can accomplish that like really impressive, right? But that's very different than being influential. Okay. And the simple example is that most of the people that have a profound impact on our life have zero social media following, right? Explain, you look at, expound on that. You look at top CEOs, they don't have time to care about their social media. Mm. You look at the people who are like defining everything from the laws that right. we have Legislation, to Right, legislation, policy, all those yeah. things. They might have social profiles, but that's not the majority of their time. Yeah. It is a thing that's sort of like an afterthought that some intern takes over. Yeah. Or, you know, there's some people who are really active like AOC or whatever it is. But, sure. But overwhelmingly, influence is comes down to an ability to have an impact on a person or an outcome. Right. So if you want to be influential, there are kind of three factors to it. It's do people know you? Like, are you connected to them? Mm hmm. Do they trust you? Right. Because influence is something people opt into. If I'm in most cases, if as opposed to power, if I'm forcing you to do something, I'm not influencing you. I'm just that's force. Mm -hmm. right? How do we affect how much people trust us? Right. And the third is the sense of connection or belonging that we have, meaning that if I know 20 of your friends, I'm going to have a much bigger impact on your life. So if we're part of the same community, you'll notice ideas spread faster. I, it, it just ends up occurring at a faster rate. Right. So it's actually beneficial that we have similar friends. Yes. This is something that I think you talked about that I thought was very interesting. Is like the gatekeeping of relationships. Yes. That oftentimes people will have a really great relationship with someone and a good relationship with someone else, and they're afraid to connect them because they're they have this fear that they're going to be cut out of their relationship. Yeah. It's and it's super common. People mm -hmm. think that like, oh. I have to, this person's really important. I need to hoard that relationship, keep them separate from everybody else so that I don't maybe embarrass, ask too much. It turns out the exact opposite is what we really want to do. And here's, here's a simple reason why. If the only connection I have to that person is me, then for them to remember me or think about me, I have to reach out every time. Mm. If I introduce them to five of the most interesting people I know, then now every time they talk to them, they remember and think about me. Every time I have an update that I share with one of them, there's a good chance it'll reach them. Right. And now 
because of all the network of connections, they're part of my community as opposed to a contact. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, even just you and I, we sat down today and we spoke about our mutual friends. Oh yeah, we have like probably 20, 30 people and we just started like yeah. to to reach the topic. Right. Uh, but with you'll notice with each additional relationship you're aware of, it increases the amount of trust that you have. Right. And familiarity. There's a really, really terrible word for this in the sciences. It's called a multiplex relationship. And multiplex it, relationship. Yeah, never use the term. It just means how many <laughs> threads of commonality do we have? So if we have three friends in common and we go to the same gym mm. and we have the same doctor, the more threads that we have in common, the more likely we are going to end up being friends and end up uh, trusting each other. Right, exactly. Okay, so and, the, so that equation of influence. Mm -hmm. can you, so it, Yeah, it's who we're connected to. Yep how much they trust us yep. and the sense of belonging we have. So connection, trust, and belonging. Okay. So now let's break those down. Sure. So how can I make connection? Like, let's say I'm, you know, 20 something year old kid. Mm -hmm. I went to college in a different city and then I, in college I had all these friends, but now I work in that city and I don't really know anyone. Sure. What can I do in order to make connections? Like what, like how would you prescribe, what would you prescribe yeah. to that person? So the first thing is, uh, have you ever gone to a networking event? I have, and yeah, I don't like the word. literally the worst. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and all of the research tells us that it is just awful. Yeah, it just feels so slimy. Yeah, it's just like, that's it. ugh. And like, you, people are talking to you and you're immediately skeptical of their motives. You're like, what? you don't even... And you came in there to do the same thing that they're there. Yeah, exactly. Right? I'm like, also an asshole. Yeah. But I'm talking to them and I'm like, ugh, it just, it feels gross. And they start off by handing you their business card. So what we need to understand is why. Okay. Yeah. So researchers uh, did a few studies on kind of this networking concept and found that our association to networking, the way that we feel about it is like we need to wash our hands right. because we feel dirty. We feel like we're using people and yeah. that's not how human relationships And being work. used, which yeah. both of those, like, like just the I, I'm taking it from both ends. Like yeah. I don't like that. They ran the same question for making friends. Mm -hmm. People don't feel that way. People are really excited about making friends. Even if you're introverted, even if you're like shy, right. everybody likes making friends. Well, the inherent nature of that relationship is different. Precisely. You know what I mean? Like a social climbing relationship where I'm going to use you to get ahead. That feels gross. Mm -hmm. And I don't like when people do that to me. And I don't like doing it to people, even if the outcome is good for me. But yeah. with friendship, it's like mutually beneficial. I want to help you and you want to help me. Yeah. And that type of connection is extremely human. And I think people feel, you know, really, really good doing it. I total agreement. Now, the uh, other interesting thing is that when you, uh, I think this was studied done on Columbia University MBA students. So like these are the people who are like spending $100,000, $200,000 just to network with a bunch of people for a few years and get drunk with them, right? Yeah. And they asked them how important is networking? They said, incredibly important. It's like why I'm here, right? right. And then they monitored them or watched them at, uh, social events, networking events. And overwhelmingly what they did was just hang out with the people they knew and then speak to one or two strangers. Yeah. So we have to accept networking just does not work. Mm -hmm. What does work is making friends. Okay. And, so how, how can I do the difference? Then, so we tend to make friends over common ground. So okay. it's shared interests. Like you might really like playing tennis. You yeah. become friends with a soccer guy. Love soccer. soccer. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, uh, shared culture, maybe you're part of a religious group, maybe you, I don't know, whatever it is, you meditate, whatever, right? Yeah. Activities, uh, hobbies. So like all these things are the things that give us common ground. Now that means that you're better off joining like three or four meetups on topics that you care about. Like literally the app meetup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You go on to meetup and they're like, oh, we do a brunch meetup, right? And you're like, I like exploring the city and trying new food. Yeah. You join a brunch meetup and a shared activity is a much more natural way to make friends than it is to go to like a networking event and pass a business card. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people know that implicitly, mm -hmm. but it feels weird to put it like, I guess if you move to a new city, you're like, because you kind of did it in life already. Yeah. Like you would make friends through your basketball team. Yeah. But you're not even realizing why you're making those friends. You just are like, oh, yeah, we play basketball together. And if when you break it down, you go, oh, yeah, it's all of us doing a shared activity together that's leading to our connection. And that's why we also survived as a species, right? right. We cannot, like a pregnant woman can't collect enough calories in the wild 
and protect her baby at the same sure. time. We need each other. Yep. So we survived because we worked together. And that's the superpower of our species. We are not the fastest. We are not the strongest. We don't even like live the longest, right? Yeah. Turtles outlive us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Or tortoises, whatever, <laughs> whichever, right? Not the ones that became ninjas. The yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Actually, I wonder how long they live. A, mu a mutant ninja turtle? A mutant? Oh, man. I mean, if they're mutated, they probably live a long time. Yeah, but they are like fighting shredders. So oh, yeah, that's a good point. Super yeah, yeah. And you're in a sewer. There's no way yeah. that's good for like air movement and things like yeah, that. Yeah, there's bacteria build yeah. up. <laughs> How many must... seasons of that show do they do? It's probably only like three and then one of them passes away. That would oh, be the saddest ending to it. There was uh, They're like, yeah, Leonardo got lung cancer and that's just the end of the show. Because like... we polluted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the, there was a, somebody did a study for how long Batman could realistically live. And uh, the argument was, in order for him to survive, he has to win every fight he's ever in. He needs 100%. Yeah. And it's somewhere between 18 months and I think three years. Because no fighter has ever lasted longer than that on any of the without but a loss. what a great run that would be though yeah. you know what i mean three years watching batman just kick people's asses that'd be awesome you know what i, I mean listen i'm i, I believe <laughs> you know, my rule is uh, be yourself unless you can be batman yeah exactly yeah that's honestly a good rule yeah. um i my thing with meetup though like because i've been in that situation where i'm in a new place and i'm like i want to make friends i want to connect with people but it feels this is the thing i think a lot of people pride themselves in making friends because all through high school a lot of people have friends mm -hmm. like regardless of your social circle and your social hierarchy whatever like sure. you will have friends even if they're band kids or chess kids or whatever you'll have friends in that social group i think people almost feel shame going to an app or something mm -hmm. to try to hang out with other people and they go oh if i go to this app it's going to be a bunch of losers not like me i'm not a loser <laughs> but all the other people that are trying to make friends are losers i don't want to make friends with losers so i I think there might be something there, right? Just kind of like there was a stigma to online dating. Right, exactly. And, it's and like those people are desperate, not yeah. me. I think the biggest issue is that uh, we're in the generation of, or the the younger generation is um, of the helicopter parent oh, okay. generation. And so there's, there's this kind of interesting characteristics of human beings. It's called anti-fragility. Right. Uh, it's made popular by uh, the guy who wrote Black Swan. Yeah. Um, and things that are fragile, like a glass, you drop it, it breaks, right? Things that are anti-fragile get stronger when you apply pressure to them. So if I go to the gym and lift weights, I apply pressure to my muscles, they grow back stronger. Yeah. Our social skills are anti-fragile. Hmm. Right? When the more we go out there and mess up a little and learn from it, and then we do something else and it works better, and then we find our social group and eventually like you know we get pretty solid social skills yeah which is amazing yeah like that is a superpower yes if every time we went out and got rejected people felt worse and then didn't learn from it and didn't grow from it oh we'd just be it would, yeah, yeah be we'd fall apart and so this is critical it's absolutely essential to our development the problem is that in a generation of helicopter parents where mom or dad or whoever set up all of your activities solved all of your problems yeah. you went to did, play dates and yeah. you met had relationships that were built in through your parents and you never actually had to work to maintain relationships yeah. like you go back you know 70 years you wanted to hang out with kids you'd play stickball in the <laughs> yeah. neighborhood somebody had to bring yeah. the ball somebody you had to, had to walk bring the five miles yeah. in the <laughs> snow uphill, both, both ways, ways whatever my parents talked about blah 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 but forces you to develop those skills right i'm not talking like trial by fire i'm just saying like hey you learn not to you know hit people you learn not to be mean you learn yeah right uh and you learn that lesson quickly so that you're part of the group and you're not alienated right and helicopterism yeah. has essentially made people have this idea that our relationships are fragile i guess well, would you say that i i would say that we've lost the skill set to develop our own relationships mm. that when mom takes care of my play dates, then I don't have to ask somebody if we can hang out. Right. And so I never build the muscle. Sure. I'm, I'm super weak. I'm scrawny when it comes to my social skills. How do you see technology and social media contributing to that? It fills your time in a way that isn't healthy. Right? Okay. Uh, so there's two aspects to social media. We know that, for example, uh, girls who spend, I think it's like five hours a day or something like that on social media, uh, or but maybe it was three hours, have significantly higher rates of anxiety yeah. and depression. I think Jonathan Haidt published work yeah. on that. Yeah, he, There was a, a great article about it. And uh, at the time when that came out, we didn't know 
if it was causal, meaning like because social media, you had anxiety. Sure. Or what I think is at least as important, if you have three to four hours of time to be on social media, not only are you like comparing your life to this unrealistic image that makes you sad and all that, of course, but you're not doing something else. And right. the thing that you're not doing is like the Girl Scouts or you're a soccer fan playing mm. soccer and you're not doing pro-social behaviors. Uh, there's an opportunity cost to the social media. That's huge. Right. And so not only are you getting filled with negative stuff, you're not doing positive stuff. Precisely. So right. it's a, you're getting double hit. So if, for example, I, my wife's pregnant. I'm super excited. Yeah. She's doing May. Congrats. That's awesome. I'm like beyond excited. And my first thing I did was, not first, but like one of the first things <laughs> I did was uh, I looked up what age someone can be a Girl Scout. <laughs> it's funny to think that that's the first thing you did. <laughs> it's, it's like one of the, and the reason is that uh, if you look at the success of, uh, you look at successful women in the US, Girl Scouts is like 1% of the population, but it's like 70% of everything. Oh, and, interesting. So like astronauts, sitting Congress people, like all that. It's because they learn community and they learn uh, to deal with adversity. And it's like an anti-fragile education system that's huh. super supportive towards girls. Oh, that's interesting. And so if we look at the statistics right now of where we are as a society, from about 1950 onward, our social ability has declined dramatically. Right. We peaked right after like World War II, post-war sentiment. We were super proud. We can do it. Televisions enter the home around 1950, and we see this sudden decline in social interaction. Right. Pe number of groups people participate in, number of friends. By 1985, we we're down to three friends besides family. By 2004, 19 years later, we're down to two. So in less than a generation, we lost a third of our social ties. Mm. And now it's even worse. Right. So you, so you, I know you talked about what you call the loneliness epidemic. Yeah. A lot of people, I think, if they've heard that term, believe it started in, you know, 2010 oh, with yeah. social media. Would you say it started far before oh, that? It's way before that. Listen, social media definitely feeds into it because, uh, and I want to separate two, there's kind of two different forms of social media. There's social media that makes you happier when you interact with it in general. Okay. Like it entertains you. YouTube, unless it's misinformation, generally does that. You watch a funny cat video or something, right? right. Or maybe like Reddit to some degree. Sure. Then there's uh, social media that actually makes you less happy. And so it's stuff like Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, where it's very comparative in nature. I look at a celebrity's life and... I'm like, oh my God, I want that. Even though you really don't, but you're like, ah, uh, now I need a Maserati, who knows what, right? Right. Um, and there's like very predatory behavior as a byproduct. People are like, oh, you could fly around in a private jet too if you follow my courses and, you know, they sell you all this BS. Yeah. So the, I, I think what's really important to understand is that as our species superpower is our ability to connect, like me and you becoming friends, means that our lives will become better. We're friends? Well, do you slow mean down that? there. Come on. The break, Come on. <laughs> that, see, I have two friends and they're both in this room right now. Okay. Yes. That, that's my number. <laughs> and that, yeah. That, and you've, you've, you're like at the average of yeah, Americans. Yeah, I'm at the average. That's, yeah. which, oh, so that two number is an average. Yeah, that's an average. Oh. Yeah. So almost. And that, was, that was years ago. Almost right? half of that is less than two. Yeah. <laughs> so they would be like, oh, I even, have one. It could be or, even, it's probably way worse than that because they're, you know, I because of the events I've run, mm -hmm. uh, I have hundreds of friends. Right. right. Which means that there's a lot of people at zero. Yeah. And there's an epidemic right now. I think it's Korea. There's something called the lonely death, which is so many people are dying in their homes and their bodies are undiscovered because they don't have any friends. Wow. And when you look at also reproductive rates, uh, we're seeing that basically the only place the population is expanding to some degrees in Africa. Right. Uh, everywhere around the world, people are not reproducing. And there's a litany of reasons, everything from infertility, sperm counts, and uh, but also because it's super expensive to raise kids. Sure. And uh, people's social skills are worse than ever. Right. I, I forget what it was. I think in Japan, mm -hmm. they released, so obviously Japan has like a, a negative birth rate. Yeah. And So do we. Oh, right. Yeah. I guess any country with birth control got a negative birth rate. People are like, let's just chill. All right. Let's just, you know, kind of travel, have a kid. Let's keep it moving. But they've uh, released something called Cabedon. 
Have you heard of this? No, no. I'm pretty sure it's called Cabe Don. I don't, I don't speak Japanese. I don't yeah. know if, you know. Uh, I have I'm not going to judge you on yeah, your mispronunciation. I have a samurai bun, but I don't speak Japanese. Um, but uh, Cabe Don is basically, it means like wall smack. And it was basically a social uh, like PSA mm -hmm. to young men about how to flirt. And they were oh, like, wow. women want a man that uh, like speaks with like a deep voice uh -huh. and uh, is like intimate. So if you see a woman and she engages with you in like a social interaction, kind of like put your hand against the wall and speak in a low voice and like invite her to something. But they had to straight up be like, and I don't know how widespread this was. There's probably Japanese people that are like, I've never heard of this. Yeah. But I, I've, if you Google it, you can, you can read amazing. about it. I've but it's basically like, okay, teach men how to flirt because we're not flirting enough. We're not having kids enough. We're not having like those intimate relationships enough. That's so wild. there's actual like government PSAs to be like, all right, let's like institute let's, let's flirting. Let's laid, yeah. Yeah, exactly, which I guess is happening in America also. Like I've read studies there's, that uh, we're having less sex now than we did, you know, 20 years ago. I find that amazing. Yeah. I, I find that especially amazing because our ability to discuss sex has just changed completely from when I was a kid like the worst thing you could have on television was Bart Simpson talking against his parents. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. Now that's like passe. And nowadays you have like every which way gender identity having sex in every way on Netflix. Right. Uh, and it's just like, oh yeah, that's that show. You right. Know? So we're talking about sex more. It seems like the availability is higher through like Tinder and Hinge and dating apps. Mm -hmm. However, people are having it much less. What do you think that's contributing? What's, contri what's contributing to that? Oh, wow. So this really isn't my area of expertise, right? Okay. I'm, I'm a behavioral scientist that studies like human connection. And, <laughs> and I, I will say I did do the largest study, in, I think, in history on dating. Right. We looked at 421 million potential matches between people. Wow. And uh, you know how people say opposites attract? Yeah. That's total BS. That's <laughs> not, not even a little. It, it, in fact, across every characteristic down to uh, which kind of university you went to, uh, your religion, down to your initials. If you had the same initials, you were 11.3% more likely to date. Yeah, that's so funny to me. It's just crazy. The one exception, and this is super funny. Um, we thought introverts would date introverts and extroverts would date extroverts. Uh, but introverts and introverts almost never date because they never talk. Of course. So that like they sense. just can't get a conversation yeah. going to save their life. Two extroverts probably could like Oh my out. God. You see the extrovert populations on these apps and they're just going at it. Oh, interesting. So it's- That's uh, so funny. What's the name of that effect where you see qualities in yourself oh, or you see the same uh, initials and you go, I like that person. Oh, it's uh, implicit egotism. Yeah, yeah, implicit egotism. I it's thought that was very funny. the reason that uh, also people named Dennis are more likely to become dentists yep. and live in Denver. Yeah. Oh, the Denver thing. That's funny. Yeah. I remember reading that in Freakonomics being like- there's no way that's true. And then at the time, I was super into marketing, mm -hmm. and my name is Mark, and I was like, oh, oh. no. I'm a, I'm a statistic. I'm a yeah. part of this. <laughs> I'm just another number. I know. Look at me, just like falling into the trend. I think people like to think they're outside of statistics. They like to read statistics and be like, but not me. There's, and then you fall into it, and you're like, ah, oh, damn it. Every, I think everybody wants to be special. Yeah, of course. A and I think that there's this really funny thing that uh, called the Barnum lie. Uh, P.T. Barnum, the great showman, right? Yeah. Uh, it's there's other titles for this bias, but if I tell you something and the opposite about you, you will remember the one that was accurate. So if I go, dude, I have to say you are really funny, but often people don't get your jokes. Huh. So now I've just said something and the opposite and you're like, yeah, I am really funny. And you're right. Sometimes people don't get my jokes. And Barnum would do these things where he would like get people to feel that something is for them or something is special. Uh, by just giving him both sides of the the thing. And uh, that's often what's done in a cold read. Like when people are pretending to be psychic, they'll tell you something that's super open-ended that could be interpreted in two ways. And you're like, oh, wow, this is about me. And, oh, and you self sort of prescribe yeah. to the thing that is true. Yeah, so like, I guess horoscopes are probably similar where it's precisely. like, yeah, you need to connect with more people, but also take some time for yourself. Yeah. And you're like, I do need to take more time for myself. And I do need to connect with more people <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. because your brain is really good at finding whatever you tell it to look for. Right. And so if you say, uh, hey, it's, uh, you know, you're the type of person who sometimes spends lavishly, you'll find the examples. And then if I say, uh, or you're the type of person who can be frugal when it matters, you'll find the examples of that. Right. But like, who knows if either of those things are even true. Exactly. Right? You're, you're just going to be able to find those examples throughout your life. Right. So the as far as connection goes, mm -hmm. finding mutual things, how important is it that those mutual things are difficult? 
Because I know you've talked about that. And okay. You talked about that in the book. So that... let's let's do both that and kind of trust at the same time. Okay. Right? Um, so most people think, at least especially in the business world, that if I want you to trust me, I'm going to do something lavish and spend on you. Right. You can also like on a date. Right. Uh, I'll take us to like the Beyonce concert. Tickets are super expensive. Now you're going to want to make out with me. Yeah. Right? Uh, and that's <laughs> really funny because if you've ever actually been to a business dinner, they're pretty miserable. Yeah. The other thing people do is like, oh, come to our event. There's a swag bag. And then people like throw out the swag bag or regift it. Yeah, of course. Right? So they're devaluing the relationship. You really can't buy a relationship. Yeah. Guy, I think guys do that more often than women. I, we're kind of dumb right. like that. We're like, oh, we're super stupid. We're like, oh, if I take this girl to this thing, she's going to like me the amount that I spent, mm -hmm. which is. I don't know if it's the inverse, but I don't know if it has the connection that I think a lot of guys think. It's It doesn't work because it's essentially saying, hey, I know you don't want to date me because of my personality or my looks, yeah. but here, maybe I can hold your attention long enough with this shiny object. Yeah. So, and then you're stuck on the shiny object you know, if anything, I wonder if it does milk. the it does the inverse where like it puts pressure. Like if a girl goes on a date with you and it's mm. a super nice restaurant, she's like, oh, my goodness, he's spending a lot of money and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to get the most expensive thing. I wonder yeah. if he's going to think of something sexually of me after this. Like I think that it puts a lot of complex dynamics and also doesn't necessarily do you any good. Right. So if I'm not going to take a girl to a super expensive, lavish dinner, what should I do? So there's uh, <laughs> some I'm, I'm going to share two ideas. One is. Uh, the exact opposite is true when it comes to building trust. It's called the Ikea effect. And the Ikea effect is that we care more about our Ikea furniture because we have to assemble it. Uh, so right. Anything we invest effort into, we care more about. So if you have a dog, even if it drives you crazy, you love that dog because you've been taking care of it. People and their kids, right? Like, Or even maybe it's like some project that you work on, you disproportionately value it. Or the ideas in meetings, when people like come up with an idea, they think their idea is so much smarter because they put in the uh, effort to come up with it. Right. So I guess if you were to buy a piece of furniture already assembled, yeah. and then you buy a flat piece of furniture, the umlaut from, yeah, whatever. from whatever, and then yeah. you build it. I'm impressed you speak Swedish so I know. Well. Thank you so much. But like you throw the... Uh, I speak Japanese and Swedish, actually. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you'll throw away the IKEA furniture at a less frequent rate than you would well, that's already what breaks assembled. down. I think you'd value it disproportionately. The study was uh, they had people uh, assemble IKEA furniture and estimate its value, and they just were way off oh, because hilarious. they had to assemble it. So, Is the same true for food? You think? Yeah, that you cook if you cook your own food. Yeah. you think it's. I mean, depending on how bad. It is. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Listen, that, that's I, where it falls apart for me. So, <laughs> so that's one thing, right? If you go on a date where you do something together that has shared effort, even like a workout, a hike, a art class, you know, whatever it is, that shared effort or even cooking together will cause you to feel more bonded and more connected than spending money on the person. Can, can the experience, does it have to be unified or can it be both of us doing an activity together? So like if we go to a pottery class, mm -hmm. we're not working on the same piece of pottery, but we're both making something together. So there's, uh, I think if you're like next to each other, then it, it works to a large degree. It, what's also really nice is that if we were sitting at dinner and had nothing in common ahead of time and we're just getting to know each other, it feels like an interview. Right. For human beings, that wouldn't have ever really been the case, right? We grew up in these communities. Yeah. When so, would that have ever happened yeah. historically, like anthropologically? Yeah. We would like... We if, would go do something. Like, if hey. we were of mating age, we would have known each other our entire life. Yeah. And we would have like known a ton about each other. We would have grown up in the same neighborhoods, right? So it means that activities are really natural for us because even if we don't want to talk at that moment, we can focus on the activity. Right. And so it's a really much more natural way to go on a date. What's up, guys? We're going to take a break real quick because I need to tell you how you can access every show available on Netflix. Here's a problem. I like to watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I go to Netflix. It's not there. I got to get a different streaming platform. I got to pay money every month to 10 different streaming platforms. We're basically back to cable. But if I use ExpressVPN, I can route my internet through ExpressVPN servers. What does that do? That gives me access to a ton of shows that I don't normally get in the United States, including 
Brooklyn Nine-Nine. ExpressVPN is what I use when I'm trying to access different shows from around the world, if I'm trying to browse the internet securely. Number one rated by CNET, The Verge, Mashable, all the tech websites, it's the one I like to use. It has no buffer time, so you can watch HD videos. On top of that, in the United States, companies can track me as I browse the internet. They can collect my data and they can sell it to other companies, but that's not the case in every country. So by going through ExpressVPN secure servers, all of my data is protected, and it's actually a safer way to browse the internet. You can find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's right, for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash gagnon. That's right, expressvpn.com slash G-A-G-N-O-N, or by clicking the link in the description below. Protect your data, get access to every show without having to get on every single streaming platform, and take control of your internet. Now let's get back to the show. Now, the second benefit is there's something called the misattribution of arousal. And I know when guys hear arousal, they immediately think like, I'm talking sex. Oh, I'm not yeah. talking about sex. Okay, I'm thinking about that. The misattribution of arousal is that we confuse our physical and emotional state for what we're doing at the time. Okay. Uh, the classic experiment was uh, men were sent to walk across like one of two bridges, either a standard bridge like the Brooklyn Bridge, super safe, or a high ropes bridge, right? Really exciting. You can, looks like you could fall, like super scary. They get to the far side. There's an attractive woman at the other side and says, hey, here's my number. I'm part of the study. If you have any questions or need anything, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to hear from you. The men who crossed the high ropes bridge disproportionately called her an astronaut. Hmm. And that's because they confused the elevated heart rate, the emotional state, the excitement, the, all of it with a woman, right? And so if you want to do something that will bond you, you can actually just pick activities that are a lot more exciting. You two, I don't, I don't know if people are into paintballing, but like going and, you know, <laughs> battling it out is a lot more exciting. And then you feel like a team because of that investment of effort. Do that on a first day. Like, yo, let me shoot you first yes. time we hang out. Okay, this would be super you fun. you two shoot together <laughs> at other people. Let's go so, shoot yes. someone else together. Yes. <laughs> yes, perfect. So that kind of stuff that's, uh, exciting yeah. and novel, right? So the brain responds to novelty to an extreme degree. There's a section of the brain. It's super geeky. Nobody needs to know what it's actually called. Go there. It's called the SNVTA, the Substantia Niagara Ventral Tagmental Area, right? I've never actually needed to know the name of that thing. It's the major novelty center. And novelty just means that something's different, right? Or new. And when the brain is exposed to novelty, it will have a desire to explore and understand right? It says, hold on a second. I don't know what this thing is. I need to be aware of my situation. And so not only are you drawn to it, if I say, hey, I've got, uh, I've got this really crazy experience where I, we're going to go eat bugs with some like National Geographic Explorer, do you want to come? Now, assuming you're not disgusted by the bugs part, you're like, holy cow, that sounds amazing, right? right? Or do you want to go? I was just in Times Square for New Year's. I was there with like uh, for the ball drop. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. It was at, one of my dinner alumni manages Duran Duran, and they were the midnight performer. Oh, awesome! So we went on the stage, got to see Duran, and then we were there literally. Uh, that's now, cool. that's, that's, like, that's the only good reason to go. Oh my god! Otherwise, <laughs> it's, people, unless I think you like, know literally Duran Duran, yeah. don't go. Okay, and, it's and not. I, worth I'm it. not friends with the band. I'm friends <laughs> with the manager, but like. The there's I mean people I think wear diapers and stand there all day right it's not yeah. like a, an environment I think but, that's for a different reason that, that they just yeah, like that's the diapers. misattribution yeah. of arousal that's so, what that is. <laughs> so the the novelty of that will draw people forward right. right if you are doing stuff that stands out as interesting and different people will want to participate mm. and then if that activity has a shared effort to it you will bond disproportionately and trust will grow disproportionately. <laughs> You see, when we do an activity together, like we're cooking or we're whatever, there's something called a vulnerability loop that gets triggered. And a vulnerability loop is the base unit of trust. It is fundamentally how trust is built. Right? And people think that if I trust you, I will be willing to be vulnerable. But it actually happens the other way. And men, listen, when I say vulnerability, I'm not talking like, Oh, you have to start crying about stuff. Vulnerability is simply being in a state where uh, something can happen, right? Like it might mean that I, I'm asking you to pass me a fork. That's a vulnerability loop. So person one signals vulnerability. Uh, I wrote a 
popular book. It's called You're Invited. It was literally the hardest thing I've ever done. I felt totally burnt out. Now, when I say that, I'm in a vulnerable state. Mm -hmm. You could make fun of me. You could yeah. insult me. You could oh, I wrote me. a book. <laughs> oh, 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 you're so tired. You're yeah. burnt out. Poor guy, right? Yeah. Like That is how it, I feel about you. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> justifiably, I am a jerk. <laughs> so uh, if you make fun of me or ignore me, trust is reduced because right. that vulnerability was punished. Of course. But if you acknowledge it, John, wow, that sounds super tough. I know how you feel because during the pandemic, you know, yeah. I was working on projects. I was working crazy hours. It was absolute insanity. The moment I see that you've, you've signaled vulnerability to the same degree, trust increases to this higher level. And the vulnerability begets trust. Yes. I think that's such a good point. I really connected with that because I feel like, especially in high school, I had a, like, I was anxious about things in general, but I had a strong desire to kind of put on this front that everything was good. Yeah. And that like people would ask me like, oh, this test, did you study for it? And I didn't study for it. And I was like, meh it's fine. It'll be fine. It'll be an easy test. Like I'll just kind of like pass it off. Like, oh, you know, it's not gonna be too hard. And I would not share my anxiety or my vulnerability about things because I yeah. felt that people would be, uh, they would have an, a, like an aversion to my problems. Yeah. And as a result, I think it made me more isolated I, because people would see me right. and they'd be like, oh, well, I'm going to go hang out with the people that are anxiously cramming for this test mm -hmm. and go talk with them and connect with them. But if you got everything figured out, like that's not me. So yeah. I'm not going to go talk to you. I love the example that you're giving because it goes to show when I was especially like through my 20s, I thought that I had to be the guy who like did it all myself. Yeah. And like had my shit handled, like all of it. And I still feel that to a certain degree. I don't yeah. like to give off this idea that I'm out of control or I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, sure. Yeah. The, but the, this idea that like people would kind of come to me and, and see I'd be working on something and they'd offer to help. And I'd be like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm my own man. Yeah. Like that's bullshit yeah. like the the problem with it is that in that moment the person opens a vulnerability loop they say hey let me help you and i would literally smack away their hand yeah and and who wants to be around that no person? that's like bratty kid behavior yeah like your parent tries to help you and the kid goes i don't want it i, I thought like, it Ugh. meant like oh people like me more because it looks like i've i've gotten you know like i've got myself handled not only was i succeeding less because i didn't have their support yeah i was also punishing people who were trying to offer me help and reducing the strength of my relationships. Yeah. And the the fact is, I get it. It could be really crappy putting yourself in a vulnerable state and then somebody not reciprocating and closing that loop. But we're anti-fragile. Precisely. That's exactly it. It's that, that, sure, that hurts a bunch, but it doesn't compare to not having friends. Yep. Right? The, the health impact of being lonely when you look at the greatest predictor of human longevity after genetics, which we can't currently control, yeah. number two is strong social ties, having close friends and family. Number one is something called social integration. It's measured by the number of people we come in contact with in a day. So are you part of a community? And so the health impact of not having social ties is on par with smoking a pack a day of cigarettes. Wow. It's terrible. So People literally, literally having no of, friends is killing you. Yes. It increases anxiety, reduces your ability to sleep, it increases cortisol levels, right? All of these kind of factors that um, lead to depression, isolation, all these things increase. And what's interesting is people who have fewer friends feel begin to feel that they're deserving of fewer friends. Mm. So if... Imagine you have four friends. One of them moves away. Then it's not like you find a new fourth friend. You go, oh, you know, everybody's leaving me. Like, I must not be that great to be around. I'm someone that's worth having three friends. Yeah. And then you lose another one. You go, oh, Because like, you're like, you start disconnecting even more. So the few friends you are used to talking to go and talk to other people who become more positive and it's, it becomes... A negative a, feedback loop. Precisely. Mm. So... Um, back to the date thing, if you want. Yeah. Um, if you are going to kind of build relationships or go on dates or whatever it is, my biggest recommendation is, first of all, for the introverts, don't feel obligated to do what the extroverts do, right? You're introverted. You don't like large groups. Great. Go do a board game night with a bunch of people or join a meetup for board games, whatever, right? Like, you like reading books, join a book club, make friends that way. But 
do a joint activity that requires some effort because it's what let us survive as a species. Going to like networking events just for the sake of like paying for an overpriced cocktail and then feeling terrible about the situation, it just sucks. Can digital communities supplant in-person communities? So I, th I think the issue is that you just get different things from it. Okay. Right? So let's take an extreme case. Let's say you are a somebody who's gay in a rural community that's super religious. Finding people who have your worldview online can literally save your life. Right. But that is not the same as having a group of people around you that give you a hug or that you can go to lunch with. Mm. It can be a critical element of our lives, right? Having a mom's group where moms can get advice or being part of like an online program or community when you need an answer for a question, that's a lifeline for work. Right. right? So it's better than nothing. It's but... not that it's not just better than nothing. It just provides something different. Okay. So if you want immediacy and scale, digital, you can get that, right? If I instead was a programmer and I only had in-person relationships, now I have to start calling everybody to find the answer. The online community is a much more effective way to, to get what you need. So I think the question is, what are, which aspect of our, our life is being fulfilled by this thing? And so what is it that you're looking for? Because um, if you're, let's say, really anxious, having a human that's nearby that you could talk to or take a walk with is incredibly impactful. And I, my hunch is more impactful than just putting a post on some board or something like that. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. That's the curious thing about uh, like social, like I guess with the decline of like religion, you're losing your social community. Mm -hmm. With the decline of, you know, staying in the same place for a long time, you lose like your immediate community that you grew up in. And so I guess more people moving losing religion, losing those main things, if you're able to find it online, yeah. it is helpful. But then being able to connect in person does something on a biological level that's way stronger. Yeah. Yeah, that's and interesting. It's just we're wired for that. It's And I'm not knocking either, right? Uh, and you bring up a really great point. Uh, there was a study called uh, How We Gather. It was at Harvard School of Divinity. Asked if people aren't going to church and synagogues anymore, right? Right. Where are they going? And the answer is CrossFit and Soul Cycle. Oh, interesting. Because it has <laughs> these spiritual aspects and really intense communities. Right. So it's that sweating together, right? If you want to get fit, uh, join what they call them CrossFit boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those have like really serious communities where people... Uh, in, like invite each other, they go out for drinks after. It's like, it's real community building. It's right. super impressive. Um, and that's why I, I very much like things that cause people to sweat. Yeah. Because, you know, to survive, you kind of need to yeah, exactly. break a sweat. Yeah, and, and you got to do something difficult. Yeah. Doing something difficult together. Yeah, it doesn't have to be super hard, right? But right. There, there's even, a, I think, a study that showed that us doing wall sits, you know, where like yeah, your yeah. legs are burning, um, not even talking to each other will cause us to like each other more because we went through that suffering together. Right. Uh, and so it's, you know, sometimes getting caught in the rain with people is the best thing for a relationship. Mm. And, and right now what we're in this trend of like, let's avoid all discomfort and pain and helicopter parents take care of everything. And like kids are 12 years old and mom is still cutting up their meals so that they don't choke. Like, yeah. Can you talk about Ben Franklin when oh, it comes sure. when it comes to the uh, the IKEA effect? Yeah, so the the IKEA effect uh, is sometimes or the similar aspect between people is sometimes called the Ben Franklin effect. And uh, there's this famous story about Ben Franklin from his autobiography. He uh, had this contentious political rival, and uh, he was up for some position. I don't remember in the state of Pennsylvania, I believe, and. Uh, and the traditional strategy is like, okay, this is a very wealthy business person who's trying to like fund his opposition. Go try and win him over. And Franklin's father had this advice. I think it went, he who has done you a favor once is more likely to do you a favor again than he who has never or something like that. Right? Old, person, uh, old world <laughs> speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but essentially, Franklin did something completely unexpected. The, the wealthy business person has... Uh, who's causing him problems, had a large library 
Uh, and so Franklin asked, can I borrow this very rare book? And the man said yes and went out of his way to get it to Franklin. Franklin thanked him. And because of that investment of effort, him and Franklin became friends until he passed away. But it's because somebody does you a favor that causes them to like you more. Yeah. And there's a, a really wonderful study that was done on uh, asking people for favors. And it's actually several of these done. But uh, if I stop you on the street and you're a stranger and ask you for directions, you are probably not going to give them to me, mm -hmm. especially during a pandemic, right? Peak pandemic, not a chance. If I stop you on the street and ask you the time and you give it to me, and then I ask you for the directions, you're going to give me the directions, most likely. Right. And that's because once you've invested some effort into me, I'm viewed as somebody worthy of that effort. And uh, so I remember I was at an airport. I was in Tel Aviv. I was flying back to New York. This is peak pandemic. The line at security was, I mean, just unreal. And so I went to the front of the line and I said, hey, is this the line for like, you know, premium service or whatever? And one of the, it was like fifth person in and they're like, yeah, yeah, this is it. You just have to stand in line. It's like, okay, thank you. I went to the back of the line to see how long people had been waiting. And there was clear that I was never going to make my flight. And so I went back to the front of the line. And I'm like, hey, sorry to bother you again. My flight's in a bit. Do you mind if I join you? And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. Because Colors. I was already familiar. They had already invested effort. Right. Now, this was Israel. So, of course, literally everybody around us complained. And I'm like, yeah, guys, yeah. <laughs> calm down. It's going to be okay. Yeah. I forgot who. I think Malcolm Gladwell actually published a study about like, uh, or talked about research relating to like Israeli specifically and stop signs. Oh, funny. The, the, I, I'll send it to you. But I think it was like, of all the countries in the world, Israelis were the least likely to, stop to fully thing. stop at a stop sign. That's super that funny. they were more likely to be like, eh, it's fine. Let's just kind of keep right. moving. I thought it was hilarious. That sounds about right based <laughs> on uh, my childhood. So I'm curious, how do you not use this research? I know you talk a lot about it in the book about benevolence. Yeah. But how all of this stuff is makes a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people intuit it naturally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you grow up in New York, you might learn like, oh, you know, if I help someone with something, they'll help me with something. Or mm -hmm. if someone helps with a small thing, you know, they'll uh, help me with another thing. And like, I think people intuit these things naturally. Re you, reciprocity, for sure. Right, exactly. And so those things are kind of, because they're innate to humanity and to human beings, a lot of people just figure it out. Yeah. You are putting words and data to feelings that, you know, some people have just naturally figured out. How do you not use those things for manipulation, manipulation. <laughs> and being like, okay, uh, this girl I really like, I'm going to uh, ask her for a small favor and then ask her for a larger favor and then we're going to go to CrossFit together and then we're going to get married. And then, and then if she marries you and then you tell her about it, she's like, wait, what? So uh, how, do you, how do you tell that line? So I think that there's a, a few things we need to be aware of. Uh, one is I don't know a single person who hasn't been manipulative at some point in their life, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and it's part of growing up. It's part of that anti-fragility. It's part of trying something and then seeing like, oh God, that backfired completely. I should just be honest. It's better off, right? So... Um, and I also think that for a while, the way that social engineering and behavioral mechanics were discussed was in a very manipulative way. Okay. What do you mean by that? That it was used a lot to like, oh, here, I'm going to sell you pills you don't need, or I'm going to, uh, guys would be running these courses to teach other guys to like say whatever is necessary for right. women to sleep. With the them. game. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Be mean to them. They'll like you. Right? Yeah. Eh, you might but, just attract women that need you to be mean to them. And I don't yeah. know if that's the type of person you want. And like, are you really going to want to put that kind of persona on for your life? Is that the person you want to be? When sure. You're... It turns out that just in general, uh, unsurprisingly, it doesn't really pay off right in the long run. Uh, there's a great study by this researcher, Adam Grant, where yeah. he uh, asked who are the most successful and least successful people in our culture. So is it givers, those that are super generous, takers, those that uh, are selfish, right? Or matchers, people that mimic other people's behavior. I give you something, you'll give me something back, right? And most people are matchers. It's how society works. It's a tit for tat kind of situation. And what Grant discovered was that the least successful were the givers. Do you know who the most successful were? I don't think it's the takers. Okay. Who do you think it is? It's either 
matchers or also givers? It's also givers. Oh, really? And what separated the two groups were those who knew where to draw the line. Hmm. So givers that give so much that there's nothing left for them. So if I'm a medical student, was one of the groups he studied, and I help you study for everything you need to and then don't focus on what I need to, I'm going to fail the test. But if I say, hey, let me help you. I'm really good at these topics. And then we need to cover this stuff. I've drawn that line. Then what happens is I get the support of other givers and I get the support of matchers. Now, takers might have short-term gains, but in general, gossip will bring them down because the matchers will feel that they're being unfair because the matchers at some point will give them something yeah. and then they'll be like, screw this. I mean, this person's just selfish. Yeah, your reputation will always catch up to you. Yeah. Now, it might take a long time, but you'll notice that uh, Harvey Weinstein's in jail. Yeah. Right? Now, do, are there rare exceptions that people get away with it? Yeah. But overwhelmingly, it's really hard to get to the top and be completely, completely self-centered unless you are so talented that you have a team that takes care of it for you. Right. Mm -hmm. You can maybe be a celebrity that has a team around you that manages you well enough that like they can keep you functional. But these are like very rare occasions. Right. Right. Yeah, Mostly. that makes sense. What's up, guys? We're going to take a break real quick because I got to tell you a story. Dear friend of mine was driving on the highway the other night, driving all of a sudden drunk driver comes on the highway the wrong direction, headlights going down the highway the wrong way. My friend swerves out of the way, gets sideswiped, gets spun around. It's a nightmare, a tragic thing. Fortunately, my friend is okay, but she, you know, she's got an injury. Her shoulder hurts, her neck hurts. She's all anxious from her traumatic accident. I mean, it's crazy shit. And the last thing you want to do after you get into a bad accident is have to find an attorney and you got to call someone and they're asking you questions and it's just a lot to deal with. If you're ever injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan and getting on the line with an attorney couldn't be easier. I mean, it's more like using an app. Like you can get an attorney without ever having to leave the couch in eight clicks or less. You can submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan and get on the line with someone that can help you. One of the amazing things about Morgan & Morgan is that their fee is free unless they win. That's right. If you're injured, you can check out Morgan & Morgan Dot com, and unless they win your case, it is free. That's a pretty good deal. If you're interested, for more information, go to forthepeople.com slash gagnon. That is for the people, F O R the people.com slash G A G N O N, or dial pound law. That's for the people.com slash gagnon or pound law from your cell phone. Now let's get back to the show. You asked about the manipulation. As a behavioral science scientist, do I have a ton of knowledge and can I theoretically apply this? Absolutely. Uh, but I have two answers. One is it's really clear it's just not beneficial in the long run. Second is that I'm very, very transparent about why I, I do things like that. So I'll say, hey, um, we could go out for drinks, but you know, rather than having a habit that's probably less healthy. How about we work together, sweat a bit, we'll like each other more as a byproduct, we'll bond more, and then we can take a walk and talk. Are people ever turned off by that? Uh, the, trans people, the transparency in sort of what's happening? If they are, they probably haven't told me. Like, you know, there, there's plenty of things that people will not tell me. Sure. Uh, if they did, I don't think I'd be insulted. Then. But like, I, I'd much rather be transparent than have it backfire, right? Right, yeah. So Keep everything so, above board. Here are my intentions. I yeah. want to connect with you. And yeah. for me, and I think statistically, and based on my research, this is the best way for us to connect. Yeah. So I probably let's wouldn't say that. statistically because then they might feel like they're in an experiment. <laughs> okay, but, fair. but I would definitely say, hey, you know, it'd be much more fun bonding experience. Let's do this. Or working out is an option. Let's take a walk. Right. Like be a little active, be a little healthy, get some air. Yeah. Steve Jobs is like notorious for that. I'm reading his biography right now, okay. and he's constantly walking with people. Yeah. Just constantly, you know, let's go for a walk together. Even just like that little exertion, I think probably helps one people kind of think because yeah. you're not so confined to like this, you know, you're not in like the system one lane, you're in the system two where you're kind of like just letting it flow. And then secondly, that shared, uh, you know, that shared exercise. Yeah. Uh, I'm also like a kind of fidgety person. So I, I just do better when I'm moving. Well, I think this way with cigars also. I think the reason why guys love cigars and like cigar lounges is that there's a thing to do. Yes. So we get to talk, and if I got nothing to say, yeah, I can just take a puff. I can kind of fidget with it. I can relight it. I can ash it out. It's I have an object in my hand. 
I think oftentimes when people, especially men are talking and, you know, given, you know, all the issues with socializing today that I think a lot of people have is that they'll just kind of sit there and be like, all right, what do I do? Uh, I don't have any, uh, anything. And I think for men specifically, I also, I've heard this with bars that like men, have you heard this? That historically, like, you know, two men working together, they'd be side by side. Mm -hmm. So they'd either be walking or they'd be, you know, hunting and they'd be looking at an animal and, you know, trying to scope it out or they'd be in war and they'd every, all of men's social interactions happen side by side. And that I've heard that the bar is sort of a proxy for that. That's an that men sitting side by side at a bar is how guys specifically feel better socializing. Whereas I, women might be better socializing face to face. What do you think of that? I think that I could come up with like 20 counter examples. Okay. So I think that might be like one of those like the Barnum thing, you'll always find proof for what you're looking for. Yeah. If you but, believe it, you'll see it. Yeah. But like, <laughs> okay, but then we still need to uh, dismember the animal, cook it, yeah. eat it around the fireplace, share stories. That's true. Right. Like we raise our young. We don't raise our young side by side. We raise our young in front of us most likely so we could have conversation. Sure. Uh, meetings, all that kind of stuff. I think uh, when you're lounging, which uh, hunter-gatherers, tended to lounge a lot they were much there was much less work yeah because you bring down one decent sized animal you're feeding for a while right um so i think it's like an interesting theory i'm not an anthropologist you're not sold on it yeah i'm just not sold on it <laughs> what is the the third part of the influence equation so it's uh this idea of belonging so Got let, it. let's just do a quick review right yeah people connect over uh over shared whatever, right? Common ground. It could be religion. It could be activities. It could be interests. And one of the things that when we were talking about trust was that if you don't have a pre-existing common ground, create it, right? It's that cooking together, exercising together. It's knitting. It's, I don't, whatever you like. You like cosplay, go, you know, to whatever, design yeah. some cosplay outfits. Go to Comic-Con, make it uh, happen. Yeah. Whatever it is. And you look at Comic-Con and you find people in their element there, like in their community, in a way that they would never be back home or back in school because they get to be them. Right. So that's the connection stuff. Now, there are certain things that trigger connection. I go into it in the book in depth. Um, but if you want people to be interested in you, we discuss things like novelty, right, that like draw people in. There are a bunch of others. They can People can read the book. The trust stuff. Trust is a byproduct of shared effort or vulnerability loops, right? Vulnerability loops are part of shared effort, but they can also be communicated. They can also be signaled. It could be like, hey, pass me the, right? And you pass something to me. And that's the trust side, right? The other really critical thing for people to understand about trust is that it's not made of what we think it is. So trust, generally, researchers agree it's made out of honesty. You're telling the truth, competence, you're capable of doing the job. And the third is benevolence, that you have other people's best interests at heart. And here's the critical thing about it. Not all three are equally valued. In our culture, we think that the most important thing is competence. I can do what people expect of me. I am capable. I am strong. I am tough, right? Uh, but if you were to, you've done who knows how many interviews over the years and podcast episodes, and, all, and you were to bomb a podcast, it would be strange if your team would go, he's incompetent, we can't trust him anymore. Hmm. Like, if you screw up once, if you have a decent track record, nobody cares in general. Right. I think people tell themselves that though. Yeah, people get really self-conscious yeah. about I'm stuff. only as good as my last thing. Yeah. Game, show, podcast, whatever. Whatever it is. Now, uh, but it's all anti-fragile, right? Like you get better. You right. learn from it. And that's then if you were to listen to your original podcasts now, <laughs> it's like you it's so cringe. Yeah, it's right? awful. Stand up same way. You listen yeah. to an old stand up set, you're like, what? what Why did I they did laugh? That? Yeah, like, what was I doing? What yeah. was I thinking? Even if you do good, you listen yeah. back, you're like, ugh. But if you found out that somebody was lying to you, you'd begin to doubt everything they've said. Hmm. And the things they say moving forward. Oh, interesting. So in my in your mind, you think, especially in America, competence is like the foremost the thing. Yeah. And so I'm like, and I think that actually leads to a lack of vulnerability, that I'm not going to be vulnerable because I'm afraid that of revealing my lack of competence. Yes. So I'm going to cut myself off from everything because competence is paramount. Yeah. When in reality, honesty for a lot of people probably takes precedent over competence. So honesty will take precedence for almost everybody over competence, right? Because if you, like nobody wants to be lied to, that you want your narrative of life to be consistent. I'll forgive someone for being 
incompetent incompetent for being kind of dumb or late yeah right? it's hard to forgive someone for just looking you in the face and telling you something that's not a true. flat out lie right yeah. now there is a weird loophole and it works like this me and you are walking down the street you say hey i forgot something do you mind if we stop by my friend's house i just want to pick it up we enter the front door and as we do 40 of my closest friends jump out and scream happy birthday john and you have thrown me a surprise party yeah. That would be super weird if I turned to you and I say, I can't be friends with you anymore. You just lied to me. How dare you? How? What? <laughs> well, I yeah. never. Right? Like, yeah. it, it, you it proposed just, to your wife and she's like, really? This, you brought me to this beach? Yes. And you brought all my family here? You lied to me for this. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were just picking up shells. Yeah, right? <laughs> and now you're giving me the most precious item in the world, a yeah. diamond? How could you? Yeah. So That's funny. The, we can see benevolence that people have our best interests is more important to us than honesty. And honesty is more important than competence. Hmm. Now, in our society, we lead with competence. We need to lead with benevolence. That's also why it's so important to be direct and honest with people, because it's having their best interests at heart. And the example I sometimes give when I give talks, I do a lot of cor corporate speaking, is if somebody goes to you and says, hey, our server, uh, you, you have a podcast, you need to store your stuff somewhere. Our servers are up 99.999% of the time. You're like, oh, wow, that's really competent. Salesperson two comes to you and says, I know that for you, having your podcast be live, your files up, and your team being able to access them and your audience being able to listen is your entire reputation. I'm not going to risk that for anything. Here's my phone number, day or night, if there's ever an issue. You call me and we will figure this out together. I like that better. Yeah, you trust that person more Yeah, because they led with benevolence and then they demonstrate, hopefully, honesty and competence over time, right? Right. Now, I didn't mention any competence. I could have had the worst servers in the world, but you have my <laughs> phone number, right? Right. So, And you forgive that to an extent, but if it's consistently incompetent, that's when you're like, you have to, look, yeah. you're a great guy. You're trying to help me, but you're incompetent. We can't do and this. And that's because we view benevolence and honesty as character traits, whereas competence is something that can be upgraded you don't really view people's honesty as something that could be upgraded right i can't teach you to be more honest without yeah. a lot of therapy and yeah. a lot of injecting you with social morals and stuff like yeah. that but i can teach you how to you know fix a server or we can work on this together to yeah. make you more competent that's Precisely. interesting and so if you were even let's say uh i have a few friends who are um operators in the military right um high level special ops guys uh who I've hosted over the years. And you would more likely want somebody who is more team oriented that might be a little bit less competent than somebody who's incredibly competent and not team oriented at all, because then the ego will get in the way. Oh, that's interesting. Right? So if you could have the most talented, you know, sniper, but if they always think they're right and they don't care about the rest of the team, how are you going to operate? Because these groups, it's not like Rambo going off alone. It's teams of highly trained people that coordinate together and work together. Right. And so you're much probably better off as somebody who's slightly less competent, but has much higher levels of benevolence and honesty because your life is on the line and you need to know that that person has your back. Interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. That makes a lot of sense, especially, I know you talk about serial killers in the book. Yes. Because um, like, as far as a breach of trust, people will trust doctors disordinately. Yeah. Can you expand on that just briefly? Uh, so when you look at the the jobs that people trust the most, uh, it tends to be benevolent jobs, right? Nurses are number one. Uh, doctors are near there and so on. And the reason is that you expect people that go into medicine to be benevolent. There's very strict rules about the honesty and all that. Yeah, right? there's this Hippocratic oath and it's yeah. like benevolence, non-malfeasance, I trust them yeah. 100%. Uh, and you expect a certain level of competence, even though like if you actually look at the rules in the medical and it's kind of like funny yeah. because uh, it's just, there's so many complexities, right? Um, but everybody really has the best intentions. Nobody becomes a doctor uh, and works in an emergency room because they, they're like desperate for the money. There's much easier ways to make money than dedicating your life to like being surrounded by people who are constantly sick. Yeah, being on call all the time yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It it's, tends to be a really benevolent group of people. And so they're very uh, trusted. At, at the time I wrote the book, the least trusted was car salesmen. Now I think <laughs> it's like senators. Yeah, it makes like sense. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So this doctor specifically that you yeah. talk about in the book. So I, I talk about the good doctor. Uh, uh, I, he he was like a, had a local practice. He took care of a lot of elderly patients. Um, and a uh, mortician, I believe it was, uh, realized that a lot of death certificates were signed by him. And that's not actually uncommon because if you really are a personal doctor, you'll be the first call from the family when you're family member dies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then one day a uh, letter came in the mail from a, a British legal system, kind of like a lawyer, but, um, telling a woman that her mother's inheritance was given to the her doctor. And she was like, this is so weird. Did this person supplant me in her love? Right? Yeah. Like, Maybe she trusts him so much that yeah. she would give her inheritance to him or something. And uh, And so she tracked down paperwork and the people who signed it and what they thought they were signing was a medical release that the woman was approving a medical procedure and they were just witnesses for it they were sitting in like the waiting room and then he killed her with i think an overdose of morphine and it turned out that when they exhumed a bunch of bodies that he had killed hundreds of people and he was the most prolific if that's even appropriate to say (laughs) uh serial killer possibly in history yeah Uh, so they know of at least around like 280 285 deaths there's probably more crazy uh, hospitals covered it up because they didn't want the lawsuit what a a, reputation yeah we had a doctor that's the most prolific serial killer in history i mean the cover-up makes sense it's not right but and he seemed like he kind of looked like santa he was like (laughs) he had the look that you like kind of want to trust the guy jolly yeah Yeah. he had like a small practice or private practice with a few hundred or a few thousand people yeah, um, crazy. Yeah, but that's it goes to show that when you're on the inside, uh, it really is like when trust is established. There's also that famous case of like the Cuban spy in the CIA that covered Cuba. Oh, that uh, Ida Montez, Mont- Montez or something. I yeah, forget her name. Yeah, and and nobody like once you've built trust, we tend to like, you know push things away and not really think about it because being skeptical all the time has such a negative ramification. You can't live like that. You have to be skeptical at the beginning and then you no longer are skeptical over time. Yeah. So it's, it's not like occasionally people go, Oh, how didn't I see all the signs that my spouse was cheating or whatever? It's because we're not wired to it. Right. We're wired to trust. Right. Uh, It's not like we have an automatic default to trust. Uh, It's culture. There's a lot of cultural cues, right? Like, I'm not worried that I'm getting robbed by the bus driver in New York because I trust the MTA of New York, right? It's established itself. Right. I would be worried maybe in, if I'm traveling through Latin America that like... Where well, you have less faith in the institutions that precisely. govern. Exactly. That makes sense. So belonging, trust, connection. I'm curious, and I know you got to run in a second, but I'm curious, how did you come to this research? Why were you interested in this? And then how have you applied it to create these dinners? Mm. So I, I don't, we've never discussed the dinner, so it's, uh, we should probably update like the people listening. Um, so I initially came across, uh, I was, okay, backstory is I was in my 20s and I, was, I think I was like just about your age, a little bit older. And I realized that, you know, people always said I was smart and I worked hard, but I didn't really have any success that was meaningful in any way. Nobody cared what I had to say or anything. I was in a personal development program and the program leader said that the fundamental element that defines the quality of our lives are the people we surround ourselves with and the conversations that we have with them. So if you want to have a dramatic impact on your life, you either have to change what you're talking about with the people in your life. So instead of like talking about getting drunk, maybe we talk about starting a business. Suddenly that changes your life completely, right? Or you change the people that you're talking to. So add people to your social circle. And I said, oh my God, that makes so much sense because every day I set an alarm for 6 a.m. to work out and I don't work out and then I beat myself up for hours for not having an exercise routine and not being healthy and not being successful and you know all these things. And, uh, but as a science geek, I wanted to know if this was actually true. So I came across a study about the obesity epidemic. Does obesity spread from person to person like an infection like coronavirus? Or is it a percentage of the population? Like you don't get Alzheimer's because I shook your hand. Right. Right. Like that would be, we don't, to the best of our knowledge. (laughs) 
And what they found was absolutely startling. If you have a friend who's obese, your chances of obesity increase by 45%. Your friends who do not know them have a 20% increased chance. And their friends, who are now several degrees out, have a 5%. Yeah, it's crazy. Now, this is true for happiness, marriage and divorce rates, smoking habits, voting habits. Maybe the percentages are different, but our habits are viral. And that makes sense because when you see a friend doing something, you're more likely to do it, right? So the, that's when I realized not only do I need to meet exceptional people, so it has a positive impact on my life and hopefully vice versa, but if I connect them to each other, then not only will the experience improve my life, but it'll experience will improve their lives and draw them closer. Because with every additional connection we share, the closer you are to me. So I said, okay, I need to meet the most exceptional people in our culture. I need to connect with them. And I need to build trust with them. That way I have a relationship. And I need to give them a sense of belonging so that they have a relationships with all these other people right. that I surround myself with. Easier said than done. I think a lot of people hear that and they're like, oh yeah, duh. If you are around influential people, you're going to become more influential. If you're around wealthy people, like those things might help. But if I'm some kid living in the middle of nowhere, I don't know anyone. Yeah. What do I do? I'm sure there's people listening to this being like, oh, John, you're, you know, you know everyone or like you, like it's easy for you to do it because you probably already had this huge base of people. I had None of it. I yeah. mean, not that I had none of it. I was social, so I had some friends for sure. But I didn't know the people that I know now at all. I didn't, like, I'm not, you know, a celebrity. I didn't, my father's not some famous business person or anything like that. My father did fine. He's an artist. But, like, that doesn't really lend itself to, you know, knowing the CEO of Hearst or whatever, right? Sure. Um, so how did you change that? So uh, what I did was I modeled the behavior of the most influential people in our culture. And I asked what would actually cause them to connect and go deep into the characteristics of the book. And then I spent my adult life convincing people to come to my home, cook me dinner, wash my dishes, clean my floors. And weirdly, they thank me for it. Yeah. So I invite 12 people at a time. It has the worst name possible. I named it before social media existed, it's called the influencers dinner yeah. because I was studying what influences people. Uh, and uh, 12 people come, they're not allowed to talk about what they do or even give their last name. They cook dinner together. So you see that Ikea effect, right? And uh, when they sit down to eat, they get to guess what everybody uh, does and they find out they're sitting with Nobel laureates, Olympic medalists, CEOs. I've had prime ministers and royalty and all that. I've hosted probably over 2,500 people. My 285th dinner was last night. Oh, wow. We had everything from Pulitzer Prize winners to uh, songwriters that are Grammy Award winners that wrote like that. Uh, who was it? Oh, that super hit by Halsey and uh, and the K-pop group, BTS. Oh, yeah. So she wrote, uh, or I guess was one of the writers of it and like won a bunch of Grammys for different things. That oh, she's wow. Heard. So That's like cool. we've... we've had the entire spectrum down to the voice of the dog from Who Let the Dogs Out, the bark. Oh, he, yeah. He won a Grammy for that. Or the Baha, world's foremost expert on poisonous uh, animals. So he travels, he's a National Geographic explorer, PhD in pharmacology, travels around the world collecting the most rare scorpions, spiders, snakes, all that kind of stuff to use the venoms to make medication. Wow. So like you name them, I've probably hosted them uh, short of like, Oprah and, you know, Steve Jobs or whatever. Yeah. But I've hosted like, you know, the, everybody else. And what is your criteria? Like, how do you select groups and invite people? Uh, so I actually am not involved in it. I mean, because I'm not an expert in any industry than maybe behavioral science, tech to some degree, maybe a little. Uh, I'm uh, in geek culture. Like I, I know my Star Wars and Star Trek. <laughs> uh, but the, I've... Uh, research team of three people. They spend all their time finding top people across every industry in major cities. We have a database of 10,000 potential guests. We've hosted about 2,500, uh, 12 at a time. I mean, it's, I do about f five dinners a month. It started off super slow. Are you at every dinner? Yes. That's a requirement. That way it doesn't jump the shark. Like it doesn't, uh, because if other people started hosting them, I couldn't do quality control and it right. would grow so fast that you know how like people say they did a TED talk and really they did like TEDx something. Right. So it, 
it loses its kind of quality control. And don't get me wrong, both TEDx and TED are fantastic organizations. Right. Uh, so I didn't want like other people who didn't weren't maybe as benevolent or as systematic or whatever it is doing it. Um, and so I wanted the community to feel like they all had the same experience. Yeah, that's interesting. And how did you feel when you did the very first one? Because I think a lot Confused. of people are looking. A lot of people right. looking at this and they're like, "Okay, so I want to connect to people, so I can just invite them all to my house." One that seems way too easy. Like, so, duh, if you just invite people to your house, they'll come. But like, how do I know that they'll enjoy it? Won't they think I'm weird? Like, I think there's so many insecurities that people are dealing with when it comes to connecting with people, especially influential people yeah. that would prevent them from taking that step. So I think the first thing is like, listen, my, we don't license the dinners. We don't, right? You have to do your own thing. If your thing is like a games night or you're really into basketball, whatever it is that if you're going to gather people, do the thing that you care about. Because by the third or fourth time you're running it, if you don't like it, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. You're at a knitting thing and you're like, I don't like knitting. Yeah. Like, why the hell am I doing it? Yeah. I mean, like, is it super cool that like Gail King is here and we're knitting together? Maybe. I don't know if you care about meeting Gail King. But yeah. uh, so the the things that I would point to are one, day one, I started with people that I kind of knew. I did not start with famous people. I didn't have the street cred to do that. As the events and the dinners continued i'd ask for recommendations and so like i remember the first kind of really impressive person i hosted was um somebody who'd won an emmy for the daily show and so i met him at a party i'm like hey i run this cool dining experience he's like oh that sounds awesome and he came and then he recommended more daily show people oh, so cool. we now had like at every third dinner we had an emmy award winner and i then realized oh I should reach out to the Tony Award winners. And so I started an entire research project. And the Tony Award winners, nobody, though that's for like Broadway shows, they don't necessarily get invited to that much stuff, right? Isn't that funny? I think people have this false assumption that if you're successful, if you're nominated, if you're whatever, you don't have time to go to dinners. Like you have all these uh, other things you got to do, all these other people you like to hang out with, blah, blah, blah. Successful people know that they, their network is what gives them status and connection and... and Everybody wants a seat at the table, yeah. right? So um, the key is to just start something. It's not going to be the same. The dinner I did on day one looks completely different than the dinner I do at 285. And I hope it looks completely different from the dinner I do at like 600 because otherwise I'm not growing. Otherwise that anti-fragility is not kicking in. Right, yeah. Um, so the key is start off slow. Do something you enjoy. Start off small. People like, I'm going to run a conference and there's going to be 200 people there. And then you burn yourself out and never want to do anything again. Yep. Go to coffee with four friends and go from there, right? Like go take a walk, start a run club. I don't know what it is, but keep it super simple and small. And with small increments, it's going to just get better and better. And you're going to look back and be like, wow, I've created this entire life for myself and have been able to connect with all these amazing people that led to promotions and jobs and business and clients and media and all that. How has this impacted your life since starting it? Oh Obviously, God, there I, isn't, it's like asking a fish, how is it to be in water? Yeah. Right. I, that like what people tend to look at are like weird accolades and stuff like that. I am consistently in the rooms I shouldn't be in. Right. Not like in a bad way, but in the sense I, we talked about I was at Times Square at, on New Year's. Like, who am I? I'm a behavioral scientist and author. Like, why would I be there, right? right? I go to the Emmys almost every year. Like, what? I'm probably the only behavioral scientist in the entire room and at the governor's ball. And there are all these actors and producers and directors and celebrities and all that. And then there's me. And like, you know, I'll bump into a celebrity. We'll talk for a few minutes. And like, oh, I'm actually working on a project having to do with... Uh, would, can we talk about behavioral science? And I'm like, oh my God, that's crazy. Like, yeah, of course, super famous comedian. I'd love to yeah. do an analysis on your, whatever it is, right? Um, so like, that's kind of like the sexy stuff. But then there's the really simple stuff that really impacts your life. Like, I I was recently poisoned by a food delivery company that had a chemical in their food that I ended up in the hospital. What? Yeah. You got to call your Nat Geo dude. Yeah. Come over, fix me. I've been poisoned. So I called the former director of the CDC. That was my like go-to phone call. And wow. I called Dr. Dean Ornish, who's like a super famous doctor. And because of the community, they came and literally like 
protected me from bad medical care at the hospital. Wow. The, one of them owns a very prestigious private medical group. Um, uh, his name is uh, Jordan Schlein. He's a fantastic uh, primary care physician who owns this like concierge medical service. They sent a doctor to the hospital to make sure that I was being taken care of. Wow. And it's cool to have a bunch of access to a lot of cool things, yeah. but do you actually feel connected to the people that you're hosting? Yeah, I love them. It's yeah. like, and um, and it's reciprocal. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think so. <laughs> I, I and the, here's the interesting thing: it's never the people that you think that you're going to fall in love with. Like you think, okay, oh my god, I loved that guy's movie. I can't wait to be friends with him. And it was like nice to meet him and he was interesting. And then it's, you know, like, I don't know, somebody, the manager for Duran Duran, her name is Wendy Laster. Like, I could literally sit for hours and talk to her. Now, yeah. would you have ever thought, like, you look at the two of us, what we do, any of that, that we would be like besties and like sit down and giggle together? Yeah. Like, no. But it's just amazing that that because of the diversity of people that I come across, uh, where I end up making friends. You were just invite just like a regular dude, just like some we guy. We tried it and it ends up being really awkward for them. Really? Uh, because they, uh, people have to talk about their accomplishments and then they don't feel like they match up to everybody else. Interesting. And so what we did was we launched a salon series where we invite about 60 to 100 people, mostly former dinner guests, but hey, Joe on the street could come if, you know, they wanted. And, uh, we do a little bit of background check to make sure that they're not like right. crazy. Uh, and uh, we surprise people with three like superstar speakers. So it might be like Bill Nye, the science guy giving a talk or uh, having when the roots perform uh, or, you know, like whatever it is. Uh, and we play games and do activities and all that. And people have cocktails and eventually go home. That's eventually. Awesome. Uh, and so it's a, a really special experience, but yeah. In that scenario, it's not about your accolades. Like, there's no bragging portion. So it doesn't put people in an awkward situation. That makes sense. I, I believe that you have to design the experience for what it is that you want to accomplish. Because that's going to be the way that the community is built. Right. And so we aren't exclusive at the dinner for the purpose of being mean to people and keeping them out. We are building that community for the purpose that that way the nonprofits that are there have access to the media and the philanthropy and they can have an impact That's that awesome. way the writers could get a story in the outlets about the new books that they have coming out that way we can impact our communities and our social causes and we can bring in people that normally wouldn't be in those circles in a more social setting rather than in a, such a formal setting where they'd feel awkward right and if you're not someone that can go to your dinner specifically you can start your own meetup and and you can go you can to do your own thing, whatever right. it is, but it has to live with your values yeah. and your characteristics. If you try to copy somebody else's format, and there's tons of formats out there. There's something called Dinner on Death. There's something called uh, D Dine in Blanc. There's, uh, you know, fitness groups and all that. But if you try to copy somebody else's, you'll just upset all the people who've ever attended the, the original. Of course. And you'll always be the copycat that nobody wants to participate in. Of course. So. Well, that's awesome. Well, I really enjoyed your book. I thought it was great. Thanks, uh, where can people find it? And uh, what's the name of it? What's the name of your other it's book? It's called You're Invited. Uh, the uh, What's it called? The Art and Science of Connection, Trust, and Belonging. And uh, it's, you know, literally everywhere. You could go like into a Barnes and Nobles or it's a New York Times bestseller, Wall Street Journal bestseller. So uh, Amazon and Books and Million, whatever, right? Wherever books or Audible. Yep. Um, the I think it's even uh, there's a, a sale right now on Audible. So like if you're into that, go for it. Uh, and then my first book is called The Two A.M. Principle. That's out of print. Like the uh, it was crazy. I spent uh, ten years traveling around the world trying to understand the science of adventure. Maybe we'll talk about it sometime. Yeah. And uh, and then you can find me at johnlevy.com, and I'm on all the social platforms. I welcome messages from random strangers. I'm John Levy TLB on Instagram. Uh, T like Thomas, L like Lion, B like Boy. Awesome. John Levy, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, it. This has been an absolute blast. Thank yeah, you. this has been great. I'll talk to you soon.